let's go ahead and start with introduction. Um, and we're going to switch over to our PowerPoint in just a second, but we thought that you might like to see our faces first. Um, so I'm Heather Heckman, Associate Dean for Technology at University of South Carolina Libraries. I'm Megan Oliver, I'm the Digital Collections Librarian, along with a team of part-time paraprofessionals. I'm responsible for digitizing and describing two-dimensional items from five of our seven special collections units. Kate? Great. Kate? Sure. I'm Kate Boyd. I'm the Director of Digital Resource Services. I work with Megan and Digital Collections. And I also work with Amy Freeman and Stacey Winchester, Research Data Librarian and Scholarly Communications Librarian. Amy? Yes, and hi, I'm Amy Freeman. I am the Scholarly Communications Librarian at University of South Carolina. So we will get started. All right, thanks everyone. I'm gonna switch over to the PowerPoint and we are gonna turn off our cameras to uh, preserve the bandwidth. Um, so first, uh, very quickly, um, I'll just go over uh, what we're gonna do in the next 30 minutes or so. So um, I'll do kind of a brief crash course on the method. Um, and then the four of us uh, will do more of a dialogue um, where we go through advantages, disadvantages, lessons we learned and things that we would do differently. Um, and then I just wanna say up front, I'll say again at the end, um, that if you wanna have a candid conversation about the options that we considered, or if you wanna learn more about our process, like don't hesitate to email us. We'd be happy to set up a virtual meeting with your team um, to go through some things that, that maybe we wouldn't be comfortable saying on a file that will be up on YouTube for, for the longer term. Okay, so what is multi-criteria analysis? Um, MCA, or sometimes MCDA, multi-criteria decision analysis, is a framework for evaluating and weighing um, conflicting criteria. So it supports consideration of qualities that aren't always easily monetized, like values and features, and in this way, it's often distinguished from cost-benefit analysis. And this has given it some appeal in the policy sphere, in fact, we a UK government manual to guide our process. Um, there is software designed to support MCA, but we didn't use it. Uh, instead, we built our own tools in Excel, and we're happy to share those. Um, just reach out to let us know if you're interested in, in seeing any of that material. So um, this is the question we asked. Can we replace our current digital and institutional repository software with alternatives that meet or exceed our needs for approximately equal or lesser cost? Um, it's a question that probably all of us are asking, at least kind of in the backs of our institutional minds. Um, but it was made more urgent this year because of the budgetary crisis associated with COVID-19. We're under pressure to make cuts where we can. And, and previous efforts to consider the question had kind of fizzled, I guess. It seemed like this was a good time to adhere to a rigorous framework and come to a decision, if only um, a provisional one. Um, we currently use Contentium and Digital Commons, and we decided to consider them together, uh, since at least at the outset, this seemed the main way we could effectuate savings, and, and that has generally proven true. Um, it also, I hoped, had the potential to save some time, but of course it introduced other complications, and we'll probably talk about that a bit more later. Uh, my preferred way to make a decision about software is to try it. Uh, but repository software or enterprise systems, they're not like an app on your phone. Nobody listening will be surprised to hear. Um, I often think of the metaphor of a home. Whether you buy or rent, you rarely get the chance to really live in a space before committing to a major change. Moving is expensive, it's labor intensive, and uh, while it's relatively easy to see what's wrong with where you're currently living, and at least try to make provisions to correct those issues in the next home, uh, it's much harder to see what is right with where you are. MCA can be really helpful when it comes to producing a full catalog of considerations. Okay, so what's the process? Uh, here are the basic steps. Uh, so the first is identify uh, options to evaluate. In our case, what repository software would we consider? Then you brainstorm criteria. Uh, the manual says about six to 20 criteria for success. Um, it's important to bring diverse stakeholders in throughout the process, but especially at this stage, I would say. The next step takes the most time. Uh, you evaluate each of your options on the basis of your criteria. The tool for this step is called a matrix. In our case, it was just an Excel sheet with options as columns and criteria as rows. 
scores are no normalized um, so that everything's on the same scale. Um, when you actually do it, you grasp the importance of this pretty quickly, uh, but maybe an easy way to sort of explain why things get normalized is to point out that one criterion might get, you know, zero to five stars, another one might be in dollars. You can't just average $100,000 and five stars together and come up with a meaningful number out the other side. Um, after scoring comes weighting, uh, which may be the least intuitive step. MCA uses swing weighting, um, so it doesn't ask how important is this criterion per se? It asks, how important is this criterion given the difference between the options considered? So returning to the home metaphor, for many of us, uh, cost is extremely important when we're thinking about where we're gonna live. But if you kind of imagine that you're considering three apartments, um, the monthly rent, let's say, is identical, but the refundable deposits vary by a small amount, and every single one of those deposits is lower than your budget for a deposit. So in that case, even though you absolutely care about cost when it comes to deciding where you're gonna live, it's not something that's gonna help you distinguish between the three options. So it's swing weight would be very low, maybe even zero. In practice, uh, it's very difficult to let go of the a priori value that you, you place on a given criterion. Um, and, and whereas swing weighting in this particular example is very clear cut by design, you probably won't be surprised to hear that that is often not the case in practice. Um, because it's unintuitive, I had to do some training, uh, including one-on-one -on -one meetings to get through the wait. And I'm not sure that it was even perfect. Uh, in fact, I'm quite sure it was not perfect despite the training. Um, so even with that investment, I, I ultimately felt like I wasn't totally satisfied with this step of the process. Um, uh, finally, you discuss uh, scores and issue recommendations. Crucially, um, the point of the exercise is not to select the highest scoring option. It's to invest time in thinking slowly and carefully about the options and about the features we value and the costs that we can and can't bear. Um, regarding recommendations, we were looking to narrow the list to one or two products to trial and to build a list of criteria that could inform a request for quotes or proposals. And from that perspective, I think we were broadly successful. Okay, so all of these steps are iterative and flexible. Um, there's an order to the process, but it's not strictly linear, linear, and it may be recursive. So if you realize that you overlooked an option or a criterion, um, or that something is less important than you originally thought, it's okay. You can always go back and incorporate those changes. Um, it's not necessarily painless to incorporate changes, but, but it's totally doable. Um, some examples from our case. We narrowed our option list after evaluating some initial criteria. And then in some cases, we brought options back into consideration after eliminating them. Uh, <clears throat> MCA is, is super labor intensive. Uh, it's a formal process, and I would not recommend it for most decisions. Um, it's valuable for important decisions that affect many units and user groups, especially if the ways that they will be affected are in conflict. Um, but the point, again, is not necessarily to pick the highest scoring option, even though it forces you to score things, it's instead to think slowly, carefully, and to consider things and listen to each other. Um, nevertheless, you do have to assign numeric ratings. It can be uncomfortable. Uh, it is still worth doing, if only to kind of force rankings. Um, measured in person hours, we probably dedicated more than a month to just deciding which products to trial. Um, We've used ContentDM and Digital Commons for over a decade. We have invested literally tens of thousands of person hours in them. Uh, I think it was reasonable to spend hundreds of hours asking whether we wanted to replace them and considering potential replacements. But it was not a lightweight process for us. I mean, let me be very clear, it was not. Um, MCA can be less intense. The manual uses the kind of tongue in cheek example of buying a toaster. And uh, yeah, I have used MCA in my private life. Uh, but what makes it powerful is its formalism, and for good or ill, that, that typically takes time. Um, and then I'll just quickly mention a few things about our specific process at U of SC before we start more of a dialogue format. Uh, I set up several groups to represent stakeholders throughout the libraries. Um, the primary group included everyone here, plus our digital repository development librarian um, and our research data librarian. Um, those folks had to attend every meeting and score every item, so they made the largest investment. Um, members of other groups, including special collections, technical services, and IT, 
um, had to attend at least brainstorming, and then they could opt in to rate any criteria that they were invested in. So, so this let them strike their own balance between influence and time invested. Um, users are, of course, um, super important to consider as stakeholders. I will admit, in part because of the COVID crisis, that um, I decided to, for the sake of just a little bit more simplicity, um, not take user feedback on all of the options that we were considering um, in the fall. Uh, we are taking user feedback on the options, that, the narrower set of options that we're looking at in spring. Um, our primary group included our decision makers, uh, which is part of the MCA process designating decision makers. Um, decision makers have to listen to everyone else's ratings, but they don't have to take the average as the final score. So for example, if you're the decision maker for usability, you have to listen to the input from attending colleagues and consider their scores. Uh, but if the median say is a two, and if you really believe that the product merits a one, you can still give it a one as long as you listen to the input and consider it before making that call. Um, so this helps protect scores from being swayed by too many representatives from a single shared perspective, um, while ensuring nevertheless that those representatives are heard. Um, and it also gives the decision maker some important power. Uh, and, and done right, that can help, um, help ensure that the people who use the system get more decisive input, for example. Our matrix started with 20 options and 100 criteria. Remember that the manual recommended 6 to 20 um, criteria. And it doesn't, I, if I recall correctly, there's not a recommendation for the number of options, but 20 is a lot. Um, the manual's right. Uh, 100 criteria is too many to discuss. So we ended up grouping them into categories and discussing at that level. Um, similarly, although we started with 20 options, we used some initial discussions to narrow the list. Um, in particular, uh, we asked ourselves about commu the user community, the size and scope of the user community, um, and, and we verified that all of our content could be ingested and represented. Um, we do have a significant collection of moving images, and that did limit some of our options. I tried to think about which people want to attend to discuss criteria when I was making the category grouping, rather than worrying overly about strict definitions of the categories. Um, in theory, you want to have uh, categories that don't overlap for MCA. In practice, that's quite hard. Uh, it's difficult to entirely re eliminate overlap. Yeah, we did our best. We worked our way through. Uh, in the end, it took about six months to complete the review of the six options considered, and we're now trialing two alternatives, one of which actually was not one of the six options that was considered. Um, we also, of course, learned a ton about our current systems, and that, I think, is altogether more than enough of just me talking. So um, I'm going to <clears throat> hand it over to Megan uh, to discuss what worked well. Sure. So we had several things that worked well in this process. Um, the entire multi-criteria analysis process forced us to slow down, as you would imagine, over the course of six months, be rigorous and follow through. Um, so we kind of had nowhere to hide <laughs> with each other. We were always working together. Um, so we spent a lot of time communicating and we really learned more about what each of us wants in a repository. On a personal note, I found this incredibly helpful to have this open and continuous communication with each other. Um, broadly speaking, even though it was a lot of uh, criteria, as Heather was outlining, we agreed on the criteria set, and this did allow us uh, some more speed in decision making, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and also, this put us in a really good position for crafting an RFQ if and when we are ready to migrate. Um, so yeah, Heather, do you want to kick off the, the dialogue, um, what you thought worked well? I know we're throwing it back to you. <laughs> yeah, um, well, the only thing I'll say here is that I joked from the beginning that um, everyone would probably hate me by the end. Um, Kate told me she thought it was bringing everyone closer together, and I really hope that was true. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I definitely cling to it. And this is Kate. Yes, I do think it did. We, we all talked together. We really, I mean, at least about twice a week sometimes, solely talking about repositories, the same group of people. That primary group met a ton. 
We heard a lot from the other groups as well. And like Megan said, it really made us focus. And, and also I wanna say just creating that master list of criteria was a wonderful exercise, made us think outside the box and really dream big. Um, so those were, those were some good things that worked well. Yes, and this is Amy, and, and I'll say that I certainly agree with all of those things. And I do think it brought everyone closer together and made us all much more knowledgeable uh, about the different systems we were using and those that we hope to learn more about. It helped us to just be incredibly thorough uh, and comprehensive in that evaluation process. And I know I felt a lot more comfortable with each of those systems after we went through this process, since we really had to dig in, we explored, uh, we navigated you know, the front end and the back end, plus um, got way more involved with the documentation than we ever would have otherwise. And because we did this, we knew that regardless of what we ultimately wound up deciding in the end, we had explored all of these different options. Um, and we knew that we, that would give us some ownership um, over our decision and make us feel comfortable with it. But at the same time, um, I think having that input from stakeholders all across the library really helped us to think about the different perspectives that were going into making this decision. It wasn't just us. Um, so they made us think about things we wouldn't have necessarily considered, like uh, the technical perspectives that were coming from the uh, library information team was really useful for me. And then also getting some user perspectives from, for example, the research and instruction librarians uh, really helped me think through that end user process as well. I agree. Um, working with digital collections for years, I, I learned a ton from Moving Image Research, our film archive. They um, have a very different operation down there, and I was unaware of some of the processes they had in place for inputting data into Contadium. So I, I learned a lot from how other people in the library see and use our repositories. Yeah, um, another thing that I thought worked really well was weighing that criteria. Uh, sometimes we felt a little bit uncomfortable with how a score landed, but once we weighted it, um, it helped smooth out any of those inconsistencies or irregularities that we had in that scoring process. So if something uh, popped up to the top of a category and was scored very highly that we actually didn't really care that much about, we could weight it a lot lower so that ultimately it didn't have a huge impact on the final score. And, and that helped me also feel better about that process. And in the end, we had a we had a ton of information that really did boil down to sort of the gist of what we were all thinking. It was good. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to know um, what I valued changed over the course of the six months. Did did your favorite options remain stable over time? No, mine definitely did not. Uh, I definitely came into this really excited about Sam Vera, and um, in the end, I was I was pretty lukewarm, and I was turning towards other other repositories such as Islandora and Tend. Uh, I was also surprised how um, Digital Commons definitely um, held up well under scrutiny. That was that was interesting. Yeah, this is Megan. I, I had a lot of difficulty having favorites. I had high scores, but I wouldn't call them I wouldn't call them favorites. Um, so so many of the repositories that we surveyed in this process they function in ways that require a great deal of conceptual crosswalking for me. So it's not about the metadata or the items uh, going in and being uploaded themselves. I was thinking of what we have in our collections now and how that's going to look when we migrate. Um, so the look and function of each, I think, <laughs> was throwing me a little bit. So it was hard, hard to pick uh, favorites. Um, I will say instead that I developed a short list of what I like to think of as like steady options that I could definitely go with, um, which sometimes matched what Amy needs in an institutional repository. Right, and, and I'm with Megan and that I also had trouble picking favorites. They all differed so much from each other and they offered different functionalities, many of which were desirable. Uh, but I was surprised that some offerings that I had sort of considered standard from the start because of the current systems we were using actually hadn't already been implemented or were far down in the roadmap uh, and other solutions that I thought would actually come up to the top of the short list for me. All right, uh, Kate, can you talk a little bit about what didn't work well? Sure, so we had a lot that did work well, but of course um, we need to sort of look back and think about what, what we could have worked, done differently or what didn't quite work well. Um, 
And honestly, overall, as academic libraries go, this was a very fast and furious process. It was um, pretty intense at times. We were all learning on the go how to use the Excel spreadsheet. Um, it was also difficult for us to combine the user and operator expectations of an IR and a digital library. Um, much we, we actually, I think, learned a lot about the differences of those two repositories through this process. And, and rating, ratings are hard and definitely um, feel arbitrary. So we were always, we, there were times when we were puzzled by the scores that we ended up with assigning. Um, Amy, what did you think? Right. Um, well, I'll definitely agree with that um, first point. Sometimes that turnaround period for the next criteria discussion session was a little bit challenging. Um, we were in the middle of the COVID crisis and we were all still sort of getting used to doing everything virtually rather than in person. So sometimes it did feel a little bit tough to uh, find the time to evaluate all that different criteria uh, on, on a pretty tight deadline. Um, the other thing that I noticed that made it a little bit difficult to work through this process was that um, sometimes documentation was very hard to find, particularly for the newer or some of the um, different components of open source software. And sometimes that lack of documentation or confusing documentation resulted in poor scores for me and for others, I think, as well, despite the possibility that those features might exist, they might be available, and they might be, you know, perfectly functional. Uh, so that was a little bit challenging. Uh, so as a whole, I would say that vendors who put documentation behind a login tended to be scored a little bit more poorly than others. Um, we did try to make up for this by talking to other institutions who use the system, uh, and that was very valuable, but uh, some systems had both forms of evidence and others just had one. So so like I said, it tended to result in lower scores for newer and more, um, you know, so sort of the emerging products, even though they had a lot of potential. And also, like Kate said, um, institutional repositories and digital collection repositories um, require very different features. So that made it hard to score uh, certain aspects. Um, and it was clear that certain repositories are, are much more uh, intended for one purpose over another. Um, like, for example, Cortex is clearly not designed for an institutional repository. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I think to some extent, because every option suffered for some of these things to, in at least some ways, it, it evened out. But there were, I mean, um, Cortex is a great example. So its documentation is behind a paywall and it really is focused on digital collections. So it scored low relative to the other options even though there were lots of things that we did like about the system. Um, and that, I guess, is just another case of saying it's not so much the score that values in the end as, as learning about the product. Um, Megan, do you have anything? Yeah, the, I think the only other thing that didn't really work well for me, um, be, probably because I, my, I structure my brain in certain ways, or it, it is structured in certain ways, I found that I had a lot of issues with comparing hosted repositories and open source because I feel as a collections manager, I'm not a coder. So open source is very nebulous. It's from vendor to vendor, what, what you can actually have, what you can actually do with an open source repository. Um, if you're not contracting out your web developers, you have to have like a full in-house complement of web developers. Um, and so for me, all of our open source repositories hinged on on that. Um, so it was hard for me to score them together, hosted and, and open source. Yeah, and it also kind of, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but it did also kind of seem like sometimes criteria that we had come up with uh, tended to either favor or disfavor open source or commercial products. Um, but I think that sort of uh, wound up evening out. In the end. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Sorry, I jumped ahead on you there, Amy. Uh, Kate, do you have anything to add to what didn't work well? No, I think that was good. All right, uh, what we would do differently. Um, so one thing that I would definitely do differently um, is I think I would work harder to incorporate values into the matrix. Um, this is absolutely something that falls within the framework of MCA. Um, but uh, in our brainstorming sessions, we tended to focus a lot on features, which it's very important to get that kind of material documented. 
Uh, but values also matter in, in the decision that we ultimately will come to. Um, and, and also, um, you know, anything that we pick is going to reflect our values to the people who, who use our collections. So um, it did end up being part of the conversation, but uh, I do wish that I had driven the initial brainstorming sessions more in that direction. Um, and then uh, we've got a note here to conduct more preliminary meetings at the outset of the analysis uh, to clearly outline project expectations for team members. So um, I set up those preliminary meetings. Uh, and at the time, I felt like I was asking too much of y'all. So, so that was interesting for me to see that actually there was a little more demand um, for some uh, further, uh, further introductory sessions. One thing that I might do there possibly um, so we had some orientation meetings set up for the folks who were involved in the process. I might uh, add one-on-one um, -on -one meetings too that people could opt out of if they feel like they're comfortable and, and don't want to spend another time in a meeting with me, but but more of an opportunity to talk about the individual's role and what that's going to look like and, and what their other commitments are. Um, Kate, uh, what would what would you have done differently? Yeah, on a more practical level, the Excel spreadsheet was intense that we all used, and um, I think Heather changed it halfway through. <laughs> um, I, you basically fixed a few of the formulas, I think, that, and, and that, that was good, and in the end it worked well. But there were some bumps in the road of, of a, a little bit of a learning curve for all of us to figure out how to use the Excel spreadsheet. And I think if we did this again, you'd have that down, and we would all have, it would be much easier the second time. I think we'd figure it out. Anything yeah, else, um, I, I can definitely I can definitely cop to to figuring that out as we went along. Um, and um, I would like to think that we'd be in a better position for the next time. And as I said at the outset, we're happy to ask to help anyone attending kind of refine those materials more at the outset. There is also software that can support this, but it's not something that we wanted to invest in um, just for the sake of this product project. Uh, Megan. Yeah, so. I, what I would do differently um, isn't so much about this project per se, but what I learned from this, this project, this initiative. Um, I think we should perform multi-criteria analysis more often as a, as a group, um, maybe even annually to assess a variety of digital tools and decision-making activities, not just for repositories. Um, these are the kinds of meetings that can't be emails. So it's not, um, while there is a lot of work involved, and I would like to pare down the criteria um, and find smarter ways to streamline that, I did find the actual meetings themselves to be incredibly helpful and connective with my colleagues. So just in terms of doing things differently at University Libraries, University of South Carolina, I think we should do multi-criteria analysis uh, for a variety of digital tools. And I'd like to chime in on that point. I agree. And I wish we had separated digital collections and the IR now. I, I think that would have made less criteria for both. And um, we could have really focused on those values and functions for each one of those repositories. Um, that would be different. Uh, Amy, anything to add? Um, yeah, no, you know, I actually thought it was a great process. There's not a lot that I would change about it other than uh, you know, working through some of those little wrinkles, logistical wrinkles that we had early in the start, but, um, you know, always open to improving the process in any way possible, but gosh, I thought it went pretty well. <laughs> All right, Amy, uh, why don't you take us home? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, by the end of this process, we had learned a lot. Um, some of our takeaways, as you can see, are a lot bigger than others, but all of them were pretty helpful to us uh, when considering how we could move forward with these decisions um, and also, you know, in framing how we might use MC in the future. So I hope that some of these takeaways will um, perhaps help you if you ever decide to go and un undergo a similar process. Um, but some things that we learned were that um, that open source versus proprietary conversation is it's tough, it's complex, it's nuanced. Um, and sometimes um, values and pragmatic concerns are at odds. Um, like we talked about, the process was time consuming, but we did think it was worthwhile because we had invested so many hours in our repositories. Um, we also saw that our current system use influenced our evaluation process pretty heavily. We'll talk more about that. Uh, but we also saw that the visualizations that Heather came up with 
for us during the process were really important. And they helped us understand um, perspectives while we were doing that rating, those ratings. Of course, we saw that active communication was important and that it was important to rely on our colleagues to fill in knowledge gaps about um, all kinds of stuff, workflows, procedures, uh, repository issues. Um, what did you think, Heather? Yeah, yeah. So the visualization, um, just in case that's um, worrying anyone in the audience. Um, well, first of all, again, there is software that supports it. But in Excel, all I did really was just some, some bar charts that let people kind of fiddle with their ratings and uh, weights so that they could see how the numbers they were assigning affected the final ranking for each criterion, um, which can, can feel um, it's just a little bit easier to take in, I think, if you're looking at a chart than if you're looking at the numbers. Um, kind of bigger picture, um, you know, it really drove home for me that the open source models out there are, are difficult for a research one university with a small team of developers, and that describes our, our case. Um, a very stripped down open instance isn't going to meet our needs. We have diverse collections and lots of different demands on um, our services. But also, we don't have the staff to support a customized implementation design specifically for us. Um, cost to outsource, um, we may very well be looking at outsourcing and open source implementation, but those kinds of costs can be unpredictable and that can be a difficulty for a large institution like ours too. Um, you know, looking at cost uh, more broadly as well, um, when you included labor, Relatively expensive annual fees rapidly became cost competitive, um, and they, they even outscored lower annual fee solutions once, once all of that person time was included. Um, and that's just looking at cost. That's not kind of thinking about um, other things that we might value related to, um, to the time that we spend as librarians. Um, now, I will say, all things equal, I would rather invest in people, uh, but in practice, even when I get approval to hire, it's very hard for attract and retain skilled developers at, at our state salaries. Um, and when talented staff inevitably leave, and like I wish them all the best, um, I really do, it, it takes months to replace them. Uh, we really feel that interruption. And experience has told me um, that while vendor support is not a magic bullet, we have been less likely to suffer this particular pain point when we depend on an established external vendor. Um, we haven't made our final decision yet. It, it may not be a commercial vendor, but um, thinking through that slowly really helped kind of illuminate um, how difficult supporting open source was and could be in our case. Yeah, and, and building off of that, I think one thing that really started um, standing out for us was that you know, sometimes the value of good and easy service for our users that might be offered um, by a commercial vendor might conflict, conflict with some of the values that we have internally, maybe as an institution, uh, with things like open science and open access. So, you know, I think as a whole, we're a group that's largely vested in the benefits that are brought about by um, open science, particularly, you know, when we can invest in that as an R1 institution. But we tended to struggle a little bit with the fact that um, sometimes the services and the products that were offered by the proprietary vendors that we were considering would meet the needs of our users better than those open source products. Um, so, you know, the matrix is really practical, I think, um, and that's for good reason. And, and so values were considered throughout, but I think maybe, uh, like Heather mentioned, embedding those values throughout the conversation or throughout that whole process would have been very useful for us. Um, and I, I, do, I do think that we'll do more of that in the future. Uh, All right, well, I will just close uh, by saying that MCA at this scale is emphatically not something that I would do frequently, although we could do something, um, we could do it annually if we um, did something a little bit more stripped down. I, I mentioned at the top that I actually use it in my home life, uh, and usually those meetings are about a single hour per decision. Um, but we were able to do uh, as a result of going through this process um, was um, really kind of zero in on the things that we cared about for each option. Uh, and we managed to come up with a very short list of things to track for each of those products. So just two or three criteria to check in on annually. And, and I think we're in a really strong position to be able to do some quicker reviews on this particular subject um, in years to come and maybe turn our attention uh, for more ambitious reviews to other topics. 
Um, so just a final reminder that we are happy to set up virtual meetings to discuss any of this in greater detail, including talking about specific products we considered. We are so grateful to anybody listening who took a meeting with us during our process. Um, and I guess we're grateful to everyone else too uh, for spending time with us here today.